So today when I said that, you know, Big O uh, would take out, you know, it would take up a lot of, um, uh, of, of stuff that we, a lot of time that we, uh, you know, spend, I, I really, really meant, sorry, that chapter two would take up a lot of the time that we spent in, uh, for the first couple of weeks, whereas chapter one would go by really quickly and chapter three and four, I, you know, this is part of the reason why, because it's all full of stuff that we, that's just really useful to do a deep dive into. So, um, all right. So let's just review from where we left off because last week was forever ago. Um, so we created a file called, um, and let me just make sure that it's recording the right thing. Yep. So we left off with a file, um, and we were just creating new array lists uh, just to show how long something would take. Um, so create array list. And initially we had it as array list. Uh, you know, we had this list of integers and we created it using an array list. And then this line of code over here just simply said start the timer, right? And for int i is equal to zero, i is less than 100, i plus plus. And we, all we did is that we just added uh, numbers to the end of the list and that or sorry we started by adding numbers to the uh, end of the list right and we showed that basically that you know that went by fairly quickly but as soon as I tried adding numbers to the beginning of an array list that turned out to be something that it was rather bad at for, because every time I wanted to add a number to the beginning of the array list I had to take a number and I had to shift it over I had, I had to shift actually every single number over to make room and it's taking freaking forever to do that um, and what this is, is that this is a quadratic relationship we've got going on here, meaning that basically that every time I, that, sorry, we've got a, this is a linear operation, sorry, and that doing a bunch of these together is what we call a, quad, a bunch of linear operations is a quadratic operation. Uh, and I'll get into detail on that because we're going to go over the more, you know, the, the standard, uh, we're going to go over search and sort, and sort, uh, which are very good at showing us what n and n squared look like um okay so but notice how it's just still going on and also notice that basically as soon as we do a uh linked list over here instead of a list it runs no problem the list linked list being the other type of list we're gonna uh, you, we're gonna learn okay so this is pretty cool to know that basically using the right data structure means that you're you know that you might be using a much more effective tool for the job right um you know, some jobs you can get done with a screwdriver, but what you really would like is a ratchet, you know? Uh, not that I would really know anything about that because I'm terrible at any kind of hardware stuff. That's the stuff that my wife is good at, interestingly enough. So um, now let's go ahead and uh, work through uh, the class. So let's go ahead and do the classic uh, constant time operation first, which is, uh, let's go with uh, public static int, and I'm just going to, this is a silly one, how big, right, um, which will take in a list, uh, it's going to take a list of, in, a, in, in a list of any, any type, it doesn't matter, so I can just put, actually if I want any type, i just put that there, list of lists, so how big is the list, return list.size. Now, remember, the list.size, that's a variable inside the list that's stored inside the list. So that takes no time whatsoever. This is what we call a constant time operation. It doesn't matter how big uh, it, it, uh, the list is, it's going to take the same amount of time no matter what. So over here, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the whole uh, start. So again, long start is equal to, um, you know, system dot get time, you know, get time, or let me just type system dot. Yeah, current time millis, that's it. Right? This is why it's useful having an IDE, even if you do know how to, even if you, like me, you do know how to code Java pretty well. Sometimes it's, there's so much stuff, it's easy to forget. So that's where IDEs really come in handy. Uh, that being said, if you know how to use Emacs or Vim, you should use Emacs and Vim because they're awesome. Um, end. And so now we do how big and we're going to create a list to put uh, to put into there. Now all I'm going to do is that I'm going to put the how big into this because all I care about is how long how big takes. Okay 
not how long it takes to make the array that's going to go into there. So uh, list L is equal to a new array list, right? Of and let's go ahead and say it's of integers. Okay. Assuming I know how to type and edit things, right? That this will work. Um, but you know that might be asking a bit much for me. So um, list dot yeah. So four int i is equal to zero. I is less than. Let's go with a million things. And that's a hundred thousand. Let's go with a million. I plus plus list dot add i. Okay. Cool. That's not. So now we start it, end it, system.out.println uh, end minus start. Okay, so it takes essentially no time whatsoever. Right? Once I've made the list, it takes no time whatsoever, pretty much. But if this is a list of size 10, how long does this take? It takes no, essentially no time whatsoever to do this. Right, to return how big the, the size of the list, right? Because we're just returning a variable. That takes no time. Time. It doesn't matter how many things are in it. It doesn't matter if there's 100 things in it. It doesn't matter if there's 1,200 things in it. It doesn't matter if there's 1,000. It's going to take the same amount of time. This is what we call a constant time relationship, meaning that if, you know, we were to plot this out on a graph, right, where on this axis was the input size, which is n, right? And then we have the amount of time it's going to take, right? If you're plotting this out, constant time looks something like this. Or maybe it's over here. Or maybe it's over here, right? But it's a straight line, right? Right? Essentially, essentially a straight line, right? There might be some jitter, but generally it should take the same amount of time no matter what, right? There might be some weird things that go on sometimes. But constant time just means that basically that... Um, that basically means that what well, constant time means and why we write O of 1, which means you can take some multiple of 1, right? And just you can set that as your basically as the, the time that it takes, right? And it will never do worse than that time. So, for instance, this never takes worse than, I'd say, 10 milliseconds, you know, like 10 milliseconds, even on, the, on my computer, or 0 milliseconds. It's never going to take worse. Uh, it's never going to be worse than this amount of time, right? There's some amount of time it's got to take, but it's never going to be worse than this. So worst case scenario, it's going to take this long. So on the other hand, a linear relationship means that it's going to look something like this, or this, or this, right? Some There's some linear relationship. O of n time means that there, it's going to look something like one of these lines over here. Could be, uh, what's the slope? It depends on the problem. It depends on how many operations you have to do. But there's a linear relationship. That gets set up. Okay, so let's go through a actual linear problem. One common linear problem is searching a list of stuff that isn't sorted. Right, searching for a, through a list of stuff that isn't sorted takes some time. Okay, so let's first create a. Uh, let's go ahead and modify this so that we can actually deal with random stuff. So random r is e sorry random rand is equal to new random. Okay, um, and so I need to import this. Okay, and you know what? I'm probably doing this the wrong way. Okay, so but that doesn't matter for right now. I'm just going to modify this with what I have. With what I have. Okay, so we have this random number, these random numbers going on. Um, we're going to generate this, and instead what we're going to do is that we are going to get random.nextInt, and this produces a no, uh, this will produce a number between 0 and 1,000. A, a Actually, I'll just use this one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do pop. Anyone guess what this does? What that what the plus rand int next int does? Yes. Uh, and make sure that the integer is positive? Yes, it's going to make sure, because a random integer could be negative, I'm going to make sure that we have positive integers. Why is this? Because I'm going to search for a negative number in there, 
And since if everything's in posit in there is positive, we're not going to find it because um, you know. Uh, so let's go ahead and now try. Now that we've got a random a list of random numbers going, right? Doesn't matter that's random. Our how big is still going to work you know, uh, the same way. So public static int um, search, and this is a linear search where we're searching list an in, uh, list of integers for a uh, int number, right? So what we have to do is and and let's see, this will be a we'll return the index that it's found at, okay? Which means that if we don't find it by default, we just return negative one, right? Otherwise, we iterate through everything. So list, so for int i, for, we're going to start at index zero. i is less than uh, list dot size. So all the indices from zero to size minus one, which is the last index, i plus plus. Go through them one at a time. Okay, if, um, so now list dot get um, okay. So list dot get i um, dot equals, and I always want since I'm using an object over here. Since remember, I'm storing integers in this list. I'm going to make sure I use the dot equals method because weird things can happen when you're mixing uh, when you're mixing memory locations and integers. So uh, if integer got, got i is equal to the number I'm looking for. Return i. Now, nothing. If I used double equals, nothing bad should happen. But you know, I'm just being safe here. So we're going to get the value out of the list, and we're going to check if it's equal to a number. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to go through, and you know, because this is random, if I search my list for a positive number. You know, it's pretty random what the results will come out. It'll, you know, it's gonna. Sometimes it'll go uh, 12, 13. Okay. What if I subtract this one over here? So, let's see. So we can go through, and unfortunately, we don't know if the if the thing is gonna be in the middle or if the number if 15 is in the middle in the end or in the beginning. Right, because it's a bunch of random numbers, we can actually make sure that it's going to be we're going to get 15 probably <laughs> with a high likelihood by just limiting the number of numbers we get in there. So that so notice how basically now because we're only producing numbers from zero to a thousand, it's get coming up really quickly, and that doesn't matter how big I make it, right? And the reason for that is that you know statistics say it's probably going to come up in the first thousand uh, first thousand random numbers, you know. So a randomness is throwing me for a loop here a bit. So we're going to remove a bit of randomness, even though it's a thing of random numbers, by uh, searching for a negative 15, which, if you remember, because I'm making everything positive, it's going to search all the way to the end. OK? So 12 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds. So there's a bit of jitter in there, right? But it doesn't seem to do any worse than, and that just you know depends on how your CPU is running. And what's going on, and what other things are going on in the background, right? So, because because there's no guarantee it's going to take the same amount of time. So, but what we should be able to see is that if I subtract, if I divide this by ten, then we lose a digit. And if I divide this by ten, the size by ten again, we're getting down into like one range. So let's go ahead and increase by 10 again and increase by 10 again to get back to where we were. So let's increase the size of the list from a million to 10 million, 31. So again, there's a bit of jitter in, in there. And it's not exactly like the greatest linear, you know, it looks like one of those uh, slower slopes until we get to here. Now this is taking, that one took a bit longer because, uh, you know, I actually had to produce uh, how many million random numbers? 100 million. Okay, so let's go ahead and instead cheat a little. 
just to show you this just to show you this relationship a bit okay what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna cheat a little to make sure that basically we can see the difference a bit more okay which is that I'm going to add in an additional for loop over here now normally I mentioned about like nested for loops increasing the, so the total size but that's only if both for loops are dependent on the size here you're gonna see what I'm doing over here int j is equal to zero j is equal to a thousand, so this is going to run a thousand times no matter what the size of the list is, j++. plus plus. Okay. Um, and then system.out.println, oh sorry, print, not print line. Going to print. Now if you've ever printed out something, right, so I've done a loop and you printed out all the numbers one at a time, and then you didn't print something out all, all of them, you notice that basically goes a lot quicker when you're not printing out stuff. So here I'm just slowing it down by adding some print lines. Um, just so we can see the linear relationship a bit better, right? So, I'm, so I run this. It takes a bit longer to go through, so it seems like my job is like it's working. So let's go down to ten. Let's go down to ten thousand in size. And it's because linear relationships are so fast. These and that this operation I'm doing is so simple for the computer. I do have to slow it down so we can observe. So 679, 683, 687. Okay, so now if I remove it, if I remove a zero, it cuts off a digit, essentially. 74, 75, 73. So you can see that, that if I increase it by 10 now, the size will go up by about 10. Or the amount of time that it'll take will go up by 10. So now this will take a bit longer once I add in another zero. Right? Took 6.5 se uh, so 6 seconds, right? So it would take about a full minute if I had another zero. And again, uh, I didn't have, I mean, we can kind of see a linear relationship, but it's easier to see with this nonsense statement over here, okay? And all that meant was just basically increasing the size by 10, I'm oh, sorry, multiplying the size by 10, increased uh, our, the amount of work we had by a factor of 10. Okay, thereabouts or there was some real in linear relationship. Maybe increasing it by 10 was increasing it by the amount of work we had by five, right? Maybe half of 10, right? Maybe our relationship was one over two. But the point was that that doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a linear relationship, right? And we can create a line. And what that, this big O means is that, we'll get into that, we can create a line that basically, here's, I'm gonna make this, here's our, uh, sorry, here's our actual runtime for the graph, okay? Whatever our runtime is, and because of the way that like this sometimes works out, it might look something like this. Okay, or it might be a bit more jagged. Yes. Oh yes. Uh, where if I create where right my my uh, when I run something imperfectly on computer and try to graph it, it might be more jagged. But what I can say is that I can choose some point, some linear relationship, and say, uh, you know, this line, no matter what, this is always going to be this. I'm out of, I'm sorry, probably make this a dot line. We can create some function that this will never, we can always say that this will never cross, that this will never be worse than this function. The amount, of, the linear relationship we get is never going to be worse than this linear relationship. Okay, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what that means. Yes? Do you have a question? Well, so that, that's the, the, the end behavior, right? Or could right. The beginning to yeah, the beginning can be a bit jittery, right? And that's fine, but I mean, once we get to some point, it's fine. More, I'm just trying to show you what it, what these things look like, right? We go through every, and this makes sense. A linear relationship means we basically go through everything in the list once, okay? Now, when, now, granted, when we were searching for something in here, like you know, 15, when we're actually searching through 15 in this list of random integers. You know, sometimes it will be, uh, sometimes it will take the full length of time. Right, but sometimes if we get lucky, because like 15 ends up in the in somewhere in the middle, it might take half that time. Right, because it's a random operation, we don't know where it will pop up. Let me just go ahead and stop this. So sometimes it come, we have to go through all the way to end because there are a lot of integers. But we might get lucky and it comes up very early at some at some point. Okay. On the other, so so 
when we describe the big O time, we aren't talking about just one particular run. Typically what we do is we describe worst case scenarios or average case scenarios. Worst case scenario is that we go through the entire list and it's not there, so we have to go through every single item in the list. Average case scenario over a bunch of runs is that basically sometimes we'll find the element at the beginning, sometimes we'll find it at the end. But when we average that all out, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, right? So at the end of the day, basically, we have to go through all or half the elements in a list. Then that's a linear relationship. So let's go ahead and look at a quadratic relationship. And you probably had to do uh, this one before, sorting, right? How many of you had to do with programs a sorting algorithm at some point? Five of you, okay? So let's go ahead and program that oh-so-delightful sort that everybody gets taught as their first sort, the bubble sort. Okay, and I'm not going to do the, I'm going to first do the unoptimized version of bubble sort, and then I'll do a more optimized version of bubble sort. Uh, just to show you that there's no real significant difference between the two when it comes to sorting large sequences of data. Um, so public, static, void. So first, let's go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and just subject you to some torture, I guess. So public static E extends, or sorry, T extends comparable. What in the world am I doing here? Uh, void sort. So void because I'm not actually going to be returning anything. I'm just changing something I'm getting in. And uh, let's see, list of t. So what is this? Uh, the t comparable t, sorry, the t extends comparable t, what this means over here, right? Normally I would just put this in. Okay, but I'm writing a sorting algorithm over here. Okay, and in order for stuff to be sorted, I need it to be in order. So what is compa what the heck is comparable, and what does extends mean? Well, basically this means that anything. So if I say t some generic type extends another type, this means that it that whatever this is has to be a child of whatever this is. So that means that I'm enforcing that anything that is a t has to be a comparable. And why the T here? Well, because the comparable needs to take in a generic to say, what are you comparing it to? And that's pretty straightforward. I'm going to compare things to themselves. I'm going to compare things to things of the same type. So what does comparable look like? Well, it's a very simple interface. And actually, it's tiny here, but most of the source code is here, which is simply, it's an interface comparable, and it has one method, abstract int compare to, which takes in another thing of the same type or another object. Now, the way compare to works is that you call it. Uh, and I'll demonstrate it down here because basically anything that needs to be in order is um, can, uh, wor uh, works this way. So um, comment this out for a second. Integer, okay, dot. So integer uh, um, x is equal to 5. Integer y is, int is equal to 10. So first off, the compare to is, is, at the end of the day, a very easy way to compare stuff. System.out.println x.compare to. So anything, remember, anything in Java that can, that can be put in in order is comparable. Okay, so a lot of things implement, uh, implement the comparable interface. So, and pretty much anything you want to sort would imp implement it. So compare to y. So you're, so you're going to get, so I'm just going to show you what you get after I run this a bunch of times. So x compared to y gets me negative 1. Okay? y compared to x gives me 1. And if I change these to both to 5, it gives me 0. So what compared to does, it's basically a less than, greater than, or equal to check. Right? What happens is that essentially that I have a couple of... Uh, Basically, if uh, it works like this, if x is greater than y, then x dot compare to so yeah compare to y yields one. Actually, technically, it yields a result that's bigger than zero. That's what we check for. We check to see that it that so x dot compared to uh, y will yield a result that's bigger than zero. That makes sense. If one number is bigger than another, it will yield a number that's greater than zero. Uh, if x is less than y, then it will yield 
some number that's less than zero, typically negative one. And if they're equal, it's going to yield a compare to statement will yield zero. They're the same that will yield zero. Okay, so this makes it very easy to. Now, why is this, this here? Well, because again, we're dealing with objects, and you can't use less than greater than for objects, right? So those those only really work on numbers. But fortunately, compare to works on stuff other than numbers. And this is why we like compare to a whole lot. String x. Uh, so string. Hello. Um, string y is equal to happy. And let's do x dot compare to y. Four. Told you, it can give me a positive result. Okay, what about... Um, if I do y dot compared to x. Now, again, since this is implementing it, how it implements it differs um, based on um, basically from one thing to another. The here where this is just something internal to string, like if you knew a bit more about strings, because I don't, uh, you might be get more data from that. But what we know is that this is uh, doing it's as comparing stuff in alphabetical order, right? Happy comes before. Uh, before hello, right? It comes before hello, so that's less than in terms of order. So it comes, so we get a negative number. If they were both happy, they are equal to zero. And if I, and if I switch this around again, right, x compares to y, x comes after, hello comes after happy, so it's a positive number. So this allows us to write one algorithm that will sort anything that's comparable because as long as they follow the rules that basically that it's not, again, because it wasn't one or negative one, compared to will produce a number that's greater than one, less than, sorry, greater than zero, or less than zero, right? This is with the numbers that will be produced. Then we can write something that basically we'll use. Now this won't really come up again until we do trees. But it's useful to know over here so that you've been exposed to it once. And then you'll, I'll reteach it again, but let's go ahead and see how this works on sorting a list using bubble sort. So the way bubble sort works, right? Um, out first off, how many people here do not know how bubble sort works? Okay, awesome. Less one person, but two. Yeah, uh, okay, plenty of people. Great. Okay, we, we always just need one person to raise their hand, and then everybody else is great. Like, yay, I don't feel left out, and so they'll raise their hands. So um, okay, so bubble the bubble sort is the um, is one of the more simple sorting algorithms. So I'll work with numbers again. The object of sorting is to get stuff in order um, from lowest to, to greatest to smallest. So uh, bubble sort is fairly simple. Uh, two one five four three eight. Okay, and bubble sorting is just pairwise sorting. Okay, and the way this works is that we go through um, the algorithm just simply goes through these pairs of numbers until, and, and just swaps pairs of, of items. <clears throat> and then it just does it again and again and again until we're done. So, and the reason it's called bubble sort is because, so I'm going to actually, yeah, I'll put eight and then six over here, is that the biggest number will just bubble to the top each iteration of the loop. So two and one, they're out of order. So here's how it works. We're just going to go through and compare pairs of numbers. Two and one are out of order, so we swap. One and two. Two and five are in order in respect to each other. That's the key. So we don't swap them. Five and four are out of order in respect to each other, so we swap them. Five and three are out of order with respect to each other. Five and eight are in order with respect to each other. Eight and six are out of order, so we swap them. So it's already looking a heck of a lot more sorted just in one iteration. Okay? So and we so in the unoptimized version of the algorithm that I'm going through, for basically, I just keep doing, I just do this as many times as there are, I repeat this process for as many times as there are elements, okay? So since there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements, I go through this process seven times. So pairwise, pair, they're in order, these aren't in order, so uh, swap them. Okay, then I go through again, 
And I just do that more and more and I do, just do that seven times because seven times you guarantee to have it all, all sorted. Okay? Why am I doing it in this unoptimized fashion? Because it makes it easier for me to show you the n squared uh, progression of this. Okay? So, um, okay. So let's go ahead and show you that to begin with. So four, so we're going to do this. Int i is equal to zero. i is less than, let's see. Actually, let's go with int count is less is equal to zero because I'm not going to use this one. Uh, count is less than list.size. Count plus plus. Okay. Okay. Now what do I need to do? Um, so basically, I'm saying I'm repeating this out. I'm going to do this as many times as there are elements in here. So now I'm going to go through, and what I do each iteration of this loop is I go through each element and uh, and swap pairs. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than list dot size, and rather than doing list dot size, I do list dot size minus one because Right, I'm going to start here and check the next one. So I'm going to check this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair. And it would be foolish for me to go to the last one because I can't check one to the right from there. I plus plus. Okay. And here I just simply ask, ask a very, I do a very simple if statement. If list.get i, so this gets the element at i, and now because I said that t is comparable, what's really cool over here is I can say uh, dot compare to, because I can assume that every t, so I can assume that everything in here is comparable, so I can use the compare to method. Uh, list dot get i plus one, which may be a bit much to read, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, and actually extract and extract that. Give me a second. So, and if that is less than zero, so that's a bit much to read. So I'm going to go ahead and actually just simplify this a bit by taking this out. So um, uh, t current is equal to t left is equal to list dot get i. So I'm just going to make this a bit easier to read because that was a lot of stuff happening in one line, right? So the thing on the left, the left side of the pair is equal to the ith item. And the right side of the pair is equal to you know, i plus the ith plus one item. So now if we do left dot compared to right. And if this gives me a result that's less than zero, Sorry, then, sorry, if this gives me a result that's greater than zero, that means that the left item was bigger than the right item, which means that they're out of order. So we need to swap them. So t temp is equal to um, is equal to left. Left is equal to right. Right is equal to and that swaps them. So this will sort. Um, this will take a, a. So this algorithm will sort stuff. So let's go down and test that out. So I'm going to go ahead and comment this out. Okay. And I'm going to sort the list this time. Okay. A list of 10,000 random integers, and I'll go ahead and you know print the list just so that we can show that it actually you know sorted stuff. Oh, and of course, because it's a lot of stuff, it isn't going to print it out. So I'm going to let's go ahead and reduce the size to you know 100, just to temper. So here, as you can see, it just sorts that. Oops, it's not in order. Why isn't it in order? Sort list did sort, right? I'm adding I'm adding 
random integers, but they were some of them were negative. So what was going on there? That is interesting. Why is that not working? So for account int i, i is less than size of one, i plus plus, get the ith item, right? Get the item to the right of it. If the left, if the item on the left is bigger than the item on the right, because you're not actually changing this list. That would do it. That would do it. Oh, that would do it. Okay, yeah. Silly me. I don't know why I thought that would happen, but right. I was just swapping around memory locations without actually changing anything in the list. So, good point. List is equal to uh, list.set i should be the right one and list dot set i plus one to left one. That will do it. Doesn't help if I don't actually sort things. So now everything is sorted. Awesome. Obviously just not on my A game today. Okay, so it sorts the things. So let's go ahead. So this was 100. Um, and again, that took two milliseconds. So that's pretty much no time at all. So let's go ahead and see what happens if I, um, when we do 100, sorry, 1,000. OK, so that went up to 500. And now if I go to from 10,000 to 100,000, interesting things start happening, right? It starts taking freaking forever to run, um, even though it's not exactly a hard problem, right? Sorting is not a super hard problem. But what's going on? Well, this is what an example of a quadratic algorithm, right? In the search algorithm, we just simply went through every item once, right? Here, there are n items, right? And we check every pair of items. Okay, here we're checking every pair of items. But we don't do this check once. We do this check of, uh, of comparing n items to, to each other n times. So um, to... While this is running, I'll go ahead and just put and do the do the base the, the, the big O math right over here, right? Which is that that outer loop runs n times, right? And for each of those n times, we're checking uh, we're doing n minus one comparison, right? We're checking n minus one items against themselves, so n minus one, which is equal to n times. So that's equal to right n times n minus n, which is equal to n squared minus n times. Right? Now this, when we throw this into now we don't simply say like this is n squared minus n, right? Instead we just say big O of n squared. Now why is this? Well, at the end of the day, when this number when n gets ridiculously big. This number is not going to matter, okay? What I mean? I mean, like, if, what about if this is a million? Do you mean when I say this is a million, this is going to, you know, this is going to matter? And I'm like, not in the context of n when we're comparing it to n squared. It's not going to matter because n squared is so much huger uh, that because remember, a million is what 10 to the sixth power. So we'd be looking at 10 to the sixth power squared, which is 10 to the 12 minus 10 to the six. This number dwarfs that number. By a huge amount. So at the end of the day, these small, these smaller factors, they don't matter. Only when, when it comes to big O, all that matters is the most huge, the largest, the biggest factor. So it, it finished running, by the way, and it took, and I didn't even make any modifications really, right? I didn't need to slow it down. It took over a minute to run. So we were going from five seconds to over a minute just by multiplying the size, and it gets even worse because. Every single item I add to this, that increases the amount of work I have to do by n, right? Each individual item basically means that each I that I have to do another step for each item. Um, okay, but even if I, what about like, okay, it's not optimized though, right? We don't actually have to go through this uh, the entire time um, because of the way this works, right? We do this loop n times. But we don't need to. Uh, in fact, 
this inner loop, right? We can optimize this, right? We go, we have to check and we have to go through this loop n times, but if we, uh, you know, since the greatest number bubbles to the top each time, right? We can, you know, subtract, we, we, so first time I go through, I have to check every pair, okay? But the second time I go through, I can check one less pair. And the third time I can choose, I can go through, I can choose one less pair after that, right? So what if I just put that in? One plus count, right, over here. So I subtract, so one less pair each time. Well, it's still going to take forever to run, okay? And here's the reason why. Suppose we're doing bubble sort on seven items or something like that, okay? On seven items, okay? Let's go ahead and do, and I'm going to count this a really weird way, but it's going to make sense because it's going to be nice and <coughs> symmetrical, okay? So I do bubble sort on seven items, which means the first iteration of the loop, I check six pairs of items, right? I put in six dots for six items. Okay. Now the second time, I'm going to do. I'm going to check how many items, how many pairs of items. Now that's more optimized. I'm going to check five pairs of items because I don't have to check that last one because the greatest item bubbled to the top. Okay. Then the time after that, we've got two items bubbled to the top, so I can check four items. Okay. Then I check three items. Then I check two items. And then I check one pair of items. Okay. So I've gotten, then the last time I don't check any pairs of items, right? But notice this, this is like a triangle. And triangles, as we well know, are half of a square, right? Now let's go ahead and see what I'm talking about. So it took somewhere slightly more than half the amount of time it did before, okay? Um, now, if you've taken 20, now for those of you taking math concepts two or done or calculus two, how many of you have taken calculus two? Number of you. How many of you had to work with infinite series? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one, right? Yep. See where I'm going with this now? So uh, let's flip this around and make it a bit more appealing to look at, which is one plus two plus three plus four, you know, six, right? Now let's go ahead and just increase this to, let's go ahead and increase this to n, plus, you know, n minus one all the way to n, okay? Uh, anybody remember what this, what this sum, what this series sums to? Uh, n times 20 n minus one over two. Mm -hmm. n, n times n plus one over two. So for those of you, uh, so let me go ahead and write that down on the board over here so you can see it, right? The 1 plus 2 plus 3, and you don't have to take in Calc 2 notes. This is something you can kind of check for yourself uh, and see that it works. Plus n minus 1 plus n, right? Even though it does look like I'm doing, like, it does, like, each step I'm not doing n work anymore. I'm doing n work, I'm, like, doing 1 on the first step, 2 on the second step, 3 on the third step, 4 on the fourth step, and so on and so forth. Or if you flip it around, I'm doing n on the first step, n minus 1 on the second step, n minus 2 on the third step. You'd think that would run faster. That wouldn't be n squared, right? You'd think that would be more of a linear time, right? Okay? But it turns out, right, that if you that this equation, this infinite series, locks in to a specific value, which is n times n minus 1 over 2. n minus 1, right? Not n plus 1. Yep, n minus 1. So, and if we do the math here, okay, so I'm going to teach you the rules for doing big O, or figuring out the big O of some equation right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and just split that up a bit. Um, so n over 2 times, so let's go ahead and just do, sorry, let's pull that out, 1 half times n times n minus 1, which n times n minus 1 becomes n squared minus n, right? Just doing pretty simple math, and then let's just go ahead and distribute that one half. n squared over 2. And we're kind of in that same situation here. Now, when we throw this all into a big O, right, the first thing, the first rule for figuring out what the big O of, of some expression is, right, is that the smaller expression just doesn't matter. Once this gets up to like a million, right, 
This is 10 through 12 versus 10 through 6. It doesn't matter if the, in the grand scheme of things you're figuring out how what the relative amount of time this will take is. Okay? The second thing is that, again, this over 2, you know, okay, you know, half of 10 to the 12 is still a freaking large number. So we just ignore that over 2 as well. So to figure out what the big O of an expression is, you do two things. The first is you figure out what the largest factor is and get every, rid of everything but the largest factor. Then you get rid of the coefficients. That's it. That's how you figure out what the big, the big O of, some, of what some time is. So, for instance, say I was trying to give you, ask you what the big O of, of this was. So let's just make something up off the top of my head. N times N squared minus N, uh, sorry, minus 3N plus 2. And let's go ahead and just, you know, put those in parentheses. Right, so the first thing to do is distribute to figure out what everything is. So this becomes 5n squared minus 15n, sorry, 5n cubed, right? Since that n time. Minus 15n squared plus uh, 10n. So this is n squared, it's n cubed, n squared, n. This number is huge compared to the rest of them once n gets to a huge, uh, an appropriate size. So we just throw the rest, so we just throw everything else away, and then we get rid of the coefficients. So this is a cubic time algorithm. Yes? Okay, so is the sum of that series uh, n, have an n minus one or n plus one? Let's check, shall we? I think it's plus. It should be a plus. One. It's plus? I went off of what you said, it's your fault. Uh, okay. yeah. I know. It was pretty sure it was plus, but we want to definitely check this out. So let's figure, so. Let's go ahead and check this out. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is equal to, that's equal to 15. And then if we plug it in, 5 into this equation, 5 times 6 divided by 2 is 15. So it's plus. So, um, so anyway, so n squared ends up being, basically n squared is probably as bad as most algorithms get if you're not checking like all possible combinations. But sorting algorithms, but, but as you can see, basically you can figure out if you're dealing with an n squared algorithm over here because uh, we have two loops and they both have list.size in them, right? Both loops use list.size. Here, even though while we have a nested loop in here, it's not going over a list.size. What this one is more accurately like is that we're doing a thousand statements and one statement. So this one's more, so this one is more of a, uh, you know, a thousand and one n, right? You know, which if we throw that into here, that gets, we get rid of the, we get rid of the thousand, and so this is a linear time relationship. And I know 1,000 seems like a really big number, but again, once, if we're doing n squared versus n, if we're just doing n squared versus 1,000 n, once, like, let's look at this, like, something like 1,000, no, right, so let's do 1,000 n versus n squared, and you'd think that this is a pretty big number versus a much smaller number, but once, you know, n gets to say like, uh, you know, again, I use a million. So this is 10 to the third times 10 to the sixth, which is 10 to the ninth, versus 10 to the sixth squared, which is 10 to the twelfth. This number is much bigger, right? So that's once, you know, once this path, once this gets above 1,000, this one starts dominating. It starts being much, much bigger. Again, this is like basically super loose math that I'm doing here for those of you who are taking Calc 2 or currently taking Math Concepts 2 because the point here is to get you kind of a feeling for how these algorithms feel as opposed to uh, how these work, you know, as opposed to the mathematical definitions. But I would be um, bereft if I did not go over the mathematical definitions of these things. So um, let's just go uh, and go through the slides over here. So it's hard to get a precise member of a measurement of the performance, right? Because not only on my computer is my computer different than yours, but your computer is different than everybody else's, and I might be running stuff in the background, and sometimes I might not be running stuff in the background. So we have to use this big O notation because we need sign of a mathematically way 
a way to say that this is the um, the way the performance grows. Um, now we've been doing this with time, but we can also do this with space as well. Like, like uh, you could, like you can say this algorithm uses if it if it needs you know if you have to make a copy of everything, then you could say uh, sorry if you need if you push an array to an algorithm and it needs to make a copy of every item in the array, you could say that it takes O of n time. Or sorry, over and space because it needs to use, basically, it needs to make a copy of everything in the array. It uses an n extra space. Uh -huh. If you have to make n copies of an array, then it would use n squared space because it's using this, you know, for every item, it's making n copies of that item. And that's pretty weird, but, you know. Uh, so, anyway, but the point of big O notation allows us, it does allow us to actually compare algorithms. So, it allows, and it will allow, and data structures because it will allow us to compare, like, the efficiency of one. Uh, data structure operation versus another. Um, for more than a certain number of data items, some problems cannot be solved by any computer. I actually uh, argue with this fact. It just takes a um, ridiculous. It just takes a irrelevant amount of time to solve. And by irrelevant, it means basically the universe will end before it's solved. It's solvable. It just takes more time than we actually than the universe actually has. Um, so right here's the search algorithm that we wrote earlier. They're just doing it over an array. It's linear. So as the, the bigger this gets, right, we have to search through n items. If the size is 10, it searches through 10 items. If it's 100, we search through 100 items, right? If the target is not present, it goes and executes n times, about length times. If it's present, then it will be somewhere in the middle, right? Probably on average. After like, if we did this up, if we did this a bunch over a bunch of random numbers. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times, then sometimes it'd be in the front, sometimes it'd be back, it would average out to being in the middle. So, but it would be at a linear rate, right? We'd have to go through basically every item. So we say this is O of n time, of order n time. Um, so, ooh, n times n uh, growth rate. So this is an interesting one. We're basically, we're seeing if these two algorithms are these two are of different sizes. So, right, we have a for loop. And notice over here we're searching, we're using the previous algorithm. So here we're going through this uh, for loop, right, which runs x dot length time. And this one operates y dot length time. So outer times inner is x times y length. Now, we won't really see too much of this in our class, but know that basically it exists that if you have two separate input sizes. We aren't going to see much of this in the class, though, okay? Um, and that's simply basically, uh, what, what, and what is this doing? Well, basically th what this is going through is that it's taking one, say we have some, uh, some, something of a, a very long, uh, it's actually pretty easy to draw over here if we, it's just pretty easy to understand if we draw it. Um, we're just trying to see basically, uh, say we're trying to, and I don't think this is what they have up there, are different. Right. Say we're trying to, we've got this list uh, x over here, and then we've got this li this smaller list y over here. Okay. And this is made up of a bunch of elements, right? Just whatever. It's just made up of a bunch of elements. Okay. And this one's made up of maybe like three elements: five, seven, and fifteen. Okay. And we're going to check basically does this list contain any of the elements in here, right? So are any of these five, seven, or fifteen, right? Well, it makes sense that basically I have to check the first one three times, and the second one three times, and the third one three times, and the fourth one three times, right? So this would be, if this is n long, and this is m long, this would be, for each of the n items, I have to check m things, right? Now, if this one is, uh, and if this grows, right, if this gets bigger, then, of course, this run times gets bigger over here, but not over here. So that's all that. So that's a different one, but I think it's a nice, nicer example than we've got here. Um, so this one I like are unique, and I'm going to totally steal this um, to put in here. Um, right, and this is similar to what you – right, I gave you this question on your homework too, but with array lists, right? To so write an algorithm that says look for everything that is unique, right? Uh, you know, for, you know, make, and this is making sure that basically everything in the list is unique or the array is unique, right? Okay, so that's fairly straightforward to deal with.
Um, and what we have to do is that this checks, um, it goes through each item, and it goes through yeah. each item, sorry, it goes through each item, and then it checks it, it against the n minus 1 other items. So it's n times n minus 1. So for each of the n items, you check it against n minus 1 other items. So it ends up being n times n minus 1, which is n squared. Right, and notice it's two nested for loops, and both of them for loops use x dot length. Yes? When you set like j equal to i plus 1, does that activate So it does the same thing that I was showing you earlier, which is basically that, um, right, because we can optimize this. We can just check one to the right, right? Once we check, we don't have to check any of the items behind us because they've already checked us to see if we're unique, right? So if we just check the units and the items in front of us, that's okay. Um, and what we're doing here is that we're checking n minus 1 items for the first item, n minus 2 for the second one, n minus 3 for the third, and so on and so forth until we're just checking one item, right? So that's, and if we flip that over, that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way up to n minus 1, which again would be, you know, which would be n minus 1 times n minus 2, sorry, n minus 1 times n plus, n minus 1 times n over 2. Which, what? Well, it would, M be, it would be n time, well, because we're doing n minus 1 checks, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. So let me switch the variables. We'd be checking k minus 1, k minus 2, k minus 3 items, k minus 4. And so if we plug that into the equation, it would be k, it would be k minus 1 times k over 2. Okay. Um, all right. So, so it's still n squared. It's still n squared. Okay, um, so big O, you can think of, well, so what is big O? Because we've been saying a lot. Think of it as the order of magnitude. That's, the, that's, a, that's a good abbreviation. Big O is the order of magnitude of the problem. So, and again, the easy way to determine it is, you know, if we're going, assuming the loop body is only simple statements, a single loop is O of N, N squared, where nested loops, nested loop inside of a nested loop is O to the nth power, O to the third power. Um, so a thing like this, where basically you've got where n is the size of the item, into i is equal to zero, i is less than n. So this is an o to the nth statement over here, right? Sorry, sorry, an o n squared statement over here. This runs. This statement runs n squared times. This loop executes five n times, right? And then you've got 25 simple statements down there because of the dot dot dot. So we would say that the total amount of time this algorithm it takes is, given the number of inputs, is t of n is equal to n squared plus 5n plus 25. And because these simple statements do run like different amount of times, like sometimes it's a bit easier to add, you know, depending on how your computer works, it'd be easier to add numbers versus comparing them, right? So, and the formal definition is that the time of the algorithm takes is equal to the big O of f of n. And um, this is all stuff you'll learn in, 20, in 1068, but basically there exist two constants, some n naught and some constant that are both greater than zero and a function, okay? But yeah, I heard, I, I heard that. It's, a, it's, it's an annoying algorithm to go through, uh, thing to go through. And basically it says once you get to a, once your input size gets to a sufficient height that's bigger than n naught, then t of n is sufficiently dominated by this function. In other words, once we get a good inset, uh, once we get to a good uh, input size, there's going to be some constant that uh, that basically that we can say we're never going to do worse than this. So I find it easier to basically say like like here for this is the graph of the algorithm we just went through, and once we pass over here this point, we can say that this will net once we pass an input of size 5, it will never be worse than 3n squared, right? That's all this really comes down to. Um, okay, and again, I'm not really going to go through it. Here's a list of big, uh, because again, this isn't the class where you're supposed to really go through it. I might make a side video if we need to go through it a bit more, because we're just going through a working definition right now, right? You've learned, you've learned this in more detail in math concepts, right? If you're taking math concepts, yeah? So there's no need for me to rehash it, right? Um, because the book always assumes that basically you haven't done it before. Um, and you might not have, but you don't need too much for this class. What we need to know is constant time algorithms, linear algorithms, and quadratic algorithms for right now. Um, 
factorial algorithms are basically where you have to calculate every single possibility. So a common thing of this is the uh, the most common, like the easiest example to demonstrate of this kind of algorithm, O of n factorial algorithm, is the um, <clears throat> is the traveling salesperson problem. Okay, how many of you have heard of that? And how many of you have not heard of the traveling salesperson? Okay, good number. So this will come up when we do graphs again, but it's a, um, suppose basically that we've got this, all these cities over here, right? Five cities over here, and they're major cities. They're not like, you know, and this is like, well, since it's an abstract graph, they're not the scale. And from each of these cities, you can get to, um, you can get to any other city. So from here, I can get to here and here. From here, I can get to here. Um, and let's see, I can also get to here, get to this one, one, two, three, and also get to this one. Am I missing any? Four, four, four. Okay, so basically from each of these cities, since they're major cities, I can basically fly to any other city. Okay, now suppose, of course, but this is, of course, air flights, and it's, you may have noticed that basically if you're looking for flights, it's sometimes cheaper to fly out of one airport versus another airport. So the question to the traveling salesperson faces is that if I want to visit all these five cities, right, and then fly home, right, what is the cheapest route to take, right? So which order will, will give me the cheapest route? Should I go, if I'm starting from here, should I go, so let's say I assume I start from A, B, C, D, E, right? How can I possibly figure out what the cheapest combination is? Like if this, this, this uh, has a has a has a cost, and we're going to assume that it's that going from A to B has the same cost as B to A, right? Ah, keep forgetting to switch over here. So A to B has the same cost from A to B as B to A. Okay. So unfortunately, the only way we really know to to do this is to actually calculate all possible combinations, right? So that's not so bad for this one, but the how many combinations are there? Well. Uh, there's, you know, you know, I, I'm starting from here, I have four places to go. Then for my second destination, I'll have three places to go, then I'll have two places to go, and then I'll have one place to go, and then I have one route to fly home, right? Okay, so um, basically I've got n minus one factorial over here, okay? But as soon as I add another destination that I have to go to, I have to multiply that by five, then I have to add add another one, that's going to multiply by 6, right? And so the cost just explodes. Once it gets to a certain number, it's really, really, really hard to solve this problem. And by, actually, it's not hard because, you know, all you're doing is adding stuff up. Uh, the word is actually more time-consuming. It's extremely time-consuming. This problem isn't hard so much as it's time-consuming, and the hard part of it is uh, how do we make it go faster? And it's hard. But if we graph these different growth rates, um, you know, what we see is that basically you get logarithmic, it looks pretty fast at first, but then it goes really slow. Logarithmic is awesome. And we'll get into what happened, uh, where we can achieve logarithmic time. Uh, linear is pretty good, and actually linear and log linear, so n and n log n, n times log n, those are actually fantastic times. If you can achieve those, those are great. Log linear isn't too much different than, uh, than linear. That's just a linear time times a logarithmic, and logarithms, as you remember, grow super slowly. <coughs> Quadratic, when you compare it to qubit, isn't so bad, but it's not great. And exponential, as you can see, just kind of just rockets into the stratosphere. Right? And there's a graph here, basically, so showing that basically, yeah, it's much better to have a linear time algorithm than, yeah, right, where our time is, takes 100 versus time taking 1,000. Right? It's much better to have small, better algorithms. Um, so um, let's go ahead and here's, and they like, I like their example that they gave over here on the two to the nth algorithm. So algorithms with exponential and factorial growth have a factorical practical limit, and that's a good thing, on the size problem you can solve. Say your algorithm takes two to the nth time, not n squared, but two to the nth, and it takes 100 inputs. If 100 inputs takes an hour, then adding one more input doubles the amount of time which means that one more input takes two hours. 105 inputs takes 32, and 114, just by increasing the input size by 14, increases the time to about two years. So that's pretty bad. 
except for the fact that sometimes we want to, you, we actually want to use this when we're encrypting stuff. We really would like it so that the algorithms take forever to decrypt. So cryptographic algorithms can be broken, right? You can break any code, almost any code. It just takes time. You can't break one-time paths, but pretty much anything else you can break just by uh, just by trying hard enough. So uh, and it takes two to the nth time, where n is the number of bits in a key. So a key length of 40, it's considered easily breakable by a modern computer. I mean, this was like maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, so computers have gotten even faster. So, but a key with 100 bits takes a, is a billion, billion times longer than a key, well, it will take a billion, billion times longer than a key length of 40. So using something with 256-bit keys, or even if you're really paranoid, uh, you know, 1024 bits, those will take forever to break. So, all right, so now that we know about bit, enough about big O to actually have a working definition of it, and don't worry, uh, our ho your, your homework this week, right, so you're going to have a time lab and a homework this week. Your homework will actually be a packet of math problems, um, big O stuff that you're going to have to go through, uh, and you're going to be asked to do, and re remember, on this homework I said that uh, the homework I gave out on Friday and Thursday said that it would you that your next homework would use this would use the homework you're currently working on. I want you to analyze the big O runtimes. Okay, so one last thing to show you before we go on, um, and then we when we start getting into linked lists tomorrow. Last thing I want to show you is the power of knowing the proper data structures. Kind of, we already saw that kind of when we know when we did um, when we when I showed you how to use. Uh, you know, that a linked list will work better than an array list in some cases. But let's go ahead and see that over here for this our unique function. And yes, even though you have to do this as a homework, I'll go ahead and code it up in terms of a list. So list of, of t, right? So this one's kind of a freebie for you guys. Okay, x dot size, L dot size. So let's go ahead and say L L dot size, right? And this takes again. This even though we're using a list here, doesn't doesn't matter. It's going to take O of n time. It's going to take O of n squared time. Okay. Okay. So this will take O of n squared time. We try it down here. Sorry, I'll go back up to it. We uh, go with um, our unique um, you know Boolean B and just to ensure that everything is unique I'm going to go ahead and add it there. For 10,000 items that's going to take, sorry, for 100,000 items it takes, you know, pretty much no time to run through that have to actually add some difficulty to it. Oh, do I really? I oh, guess I do. Get dot equals. I was just jumping ahead to the next part of it, and I just got completely tripped up. Okay. Run it now. Um, I swear to God, today is. Mm hmm. So now it's actually taking an appreciable amount of time, but it was good. Okay, so let's go ahead and lower the size back to where we were. So it takes a time. So we're comparing each item against itself. So this takes four seconds to do. Um, and doing you know ten thousand. So so increasing it by ten, we went from fifty six to around four thousand. So increasing it by ten, increase increase this algorithm by a factor of about one hundred, right? So that's an O of n squared time. But when we know the right data structures we can use for problems, uh, it helps. We can do a lot of stuff. So I'm going to show you. Uh, set. So I'm going to show you how to use a data structure from chapter from later in the book called the set. 
or I'm going to show you what happens when we know that, that this exists. So set of t, so it's going to be of the same type that of, of the list. Set of t is equal to um, new hash set. Okay. And again, you don't have to know about these. These you'll learn them later in the semester. But I just want to emphasize what this does. So what's cool about these sets is that they're mathematical sets, which means that I can, for each item in this list, for each item in the list, um, I can take an item in the list, and and if I'm adding something to a set, I can just do that in linear time. Sorry, not linear time. I mean constant time. It takes doesn't matter how many things are in the set. It takes me just constant time to add it to the set. So s dot add l dot get i. Okay. Another cool thing is that I can check to see if something is in a set in constant time as well. So I can ask if set if s dot contains l dot get i. So if it already has it. Return false. Otherwise, I'm going to add the number I have to the set. Return true. So this is a for loop now, and because I'm using a different uh, using a data structure to help me, um, it's actually going to run a lot faster. What I'm doing is now uh, I have a for loop. This takes constant time, so this is a simple statement. This is a simple statement over here, so it's just a single for loop as opposed to two for loops. And so now it takes a heck of a lot less time. And now we're actually going to have a linear relationship using a set instead, because um, each of these. Now, what? Now, mind you, there was a trade-off when I did. Uh, I had to use extra space here because the set is duplicating all the data. Okay, but you know the end result is now it runs much faster. So sometimes the times. So a lot of times the time space trade-off. You know, space is cheaper than time. So. It's worth a while to make it. So just by knowing the right data structure, you can greatly improve uh, what you're doing. Yes, was that a question? Oh, oh no, you, you were just raising it. OK, sorry. All right, so that's what we have for big O. Um, again, yeah, I kind of skipped through a lot of stuff on here, uh, like the formal definitions and stuff. Um, what we'll start out with on um, the next lecture is that we are going to go over the, um, you know, the Big O, uh, we're going to analyze, you know, each of the operations we did. And then I'm going to talk about linked lists and show you how those work. Okay? And then that gets us into the start. And, I, and I, you know, this is the part where of the, of the um, semester where basically if you're going to get tripped up, you're going to get tripped up here uh, in, the, in the linked list. And I've done this enough times that I know how to help students from getting tripped up. So I will... It might feel like I'm, you know, I keep I'm hitting a dead equine here, but I will um, do my best to basically make sure that you understand how linked lists work.